Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. Today, the program's gonna go to the dogs. I have a guest, Jennifer Bement, and she brought along a friend, Ava. And we're going to talk about the Southeastern Guard Dogs. As media manager, it's good that you came. Oh, well, thank you for having us. And we really enjoyed when we went down and took a tour of your facility. Oh yeah, it's a beautiful facility in, in Palmetto. Uh, Manatee County. Um, we have 35 acres. Um, a lot of people, when they get on campus, they don't. They're expecting, you know, to see a kennel of dogs, and it, <laughs> it really is more like the, a university campus. It is, yeah. and it's beautiful. They've done a Thank wonderful you. job with it. There's so many things that I, I really. If you have children, pay very strong attention. If you have grandchildren, then really pay attention, because I know it is when we get people down here visiting. What are we going to do with the kids? What are they going to do that are going to be fun? What can we do in usual? You've got something to do with the kids that's really great. You oh, want to explain that? Sure. I have something amazing. It's called puppy hugging. <laughs> um, and five days a week, every day except for Sunday and Thursday, um, at 9 o'clock and then at 10 o'clock, we have sessions of puppy hugging. So, really? Yep. So you go online and you make a reservation, and then you show up at your appointed time, sit down in the floor in the puppy hugging area, and we let loose puppies for you to play with. I mean, really, it's great, great fun. Um, the kids love it. The adults love it even more. Um, and it's great for our dogs because it gets them used to a lot of different people. So the way different people sound or smell really? or move. That's um, an added benefit for certain. Yeah, it's all, it's all part of their um, exposure to get them used to the things that they're going to run into later on in life when they're you know, being a guide dog for somebody. So it's great for them. It's great for the community. And um, it's really, really a terrific thing to do with the kids. I have to admit, we did take our grandchildren down there and they just had a fabulous time uh, there was one young man that goes down I think he must be there regularly uh, because the puppies really knew him, oh. <laughs> He'd run over to him. I, I thought maybe he had bacon grease put on his shoes or something he very well could have I think I do know who you're talking about um, he's a staff member that um, was pretty much the puppy whisperer they would follow him wherever he went <laughs> and it, it is so much fun I was saying to Jennifer one of the things that'd be really good at all these peace conferences, maybe even with our Congress, let a bunch of puppies loose. You, you just can't You can't be, be angry. No, you can't angry. be angry when you've got a puppy, you know, trying to give you kisses, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the organization. How is it funded? Um, we are funded thanks to the generosity of the community. Um, we receive no government funding. No government funding at no, all? No government funding at all. It's all thanks to the very generous public that get behind our cause and um, feel very strongly about helping dogs to help other people. Um, and it's an incredible, an incredible organization. We've been around for 31 years um, and we plan to be here for many, many years coming forward so long as we've got the backing of the community. You know, it's interesting when you say that. I knew that you provided guide dogs to veterans. Mm -hmm. So I thought possibly there might be some quid pro quo from the government for the for the vets. But. Yeah, no, even though we have our Paws for Patriots program, which provides guide dogs to visually impaired veterans, um, veteran service dogs to veterans living with post-traumatic stress, and facility therapy dogs to um, major medical military facilities, we receive no government funding because, quite honestly, you don't know if that funding is going to be there next year. And as responsible stewards of um, what we do, we need to make sure we're going to be there for many, many years to come. That makes real sense. Uh, maybe a whole lot of people should be <laughs> thinking about it and thinking that way. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned several different kinds of things. When I think of guide dogs, I think of the person with the harness walking along. They're blind, the dog is. But you mentioned a number of other mm -hmm. aspects of, of this. What are some of them and what do they do? Well, our primary goal is to provide extraordinary guide dogs for the visually impaired so okay. that they can get safely from point A to point B. Um, however, not every dog that we breed and train is meant, out, meant to be a guide dog. Um, they might have sensibilities in other areas. Um, say that dog is an excessive sniffer. Well, that's going to take that dog's attention away from guiding somebody safely. True. Um, but, you know, that would make a really great bomb and arson detection dog or a drug detection dog. Really? Yep. So we have public service dogs that we turn over then to the proper authorities to get 
the training that they need and move on in that career. But you don't do that kind of training. Then. We don't do that kind of training. Okay. I mentioned veteran service dogs earlier. Those are dogs that are totally what we call bomb proof. Um, nothing phases them whatsoever. And they're also highly empathetic. So they're wonderful service dogs for veterans that live with post-traumatic stress and um, the problems that can create in their life. So those dogs are trained to do very specific tasks that help that um, that veteran mitigate his post-traumatic stress or her post-traumatic stress. So when they feel they're going into it, the dog feels that too? They do. I've seen some things on television, you never know whether they're true or not. They are very true. Um, I've seen it personally. Um, the dogs are taught very specific commands. So one of the main things that um, people living with post-traumatic stress deal with is a problem with being too close to someone or someone coming up behind them. Um, the dog is taught a block command. So if that person is starting to feel antsy about uh -huh. the distance between you and I, uh -huh. um, I could put Ava right here in front of me and she would block you from coming closer and I could take a step back. Ah. Um, so then I would be more comfortable with my space. Okay. Um, likewise, there, someone coming up from behind is very scary. Um, so the dog can be put into a reverse heel so that it's facing behind. And just by that, that dog's body language, the person would know if someone was coming up behind them and if that person was a threat. And then they could turn around, put the dog in the block position, and the dog would hold its space there. Wow. But probably the most amazing things that those dogs do, um, and it sounds a little trite, they're taught to hug on command. What do you think that that would do for somebody? Well, I, I think that's fair. I'm a big hugger, folks. <laughs> I, I used to do these seminars, I still do, around the country. And I've hugged as many as 4,000 people in line. Holy cow. I mean, it's, it's just been, been wonderful. I'd well, come so home. you know the healing power of a hug. Yeah. So these dogs realize when, um, when their person starts to feel a little anxious or if maybe they're going into a flashback, then that dog would come and put their pressure on their lap, um, might even come up and, and put their paws up on their shoulders and, and the oh. um, person can hold on to their dog then and it grounds them in the moment so that they can realize that they're safe and that there's nothing to worry about and um, then they can get on with their life. Wow. It's really an amazing thing to see. You know, I think, uh, I can't think of the name of the show, it's a concierge doctor on one of the islands, some, or Long Island, not Long Island, but the Hamptons. The, and the, the Hamptons, yes. yeah. And, and he found a dog that could go with a guy who was a diabetic mm. and sniff out whether or not, is that really true? Yeah, there are diabetic um, service dogs. We don't train them yeah. um, personally, but um, there are dogs that al alert when blood sugars are changing because blood dogs have an amazing sense of smell. Yeah. Far, far better than humans do. And there's a certain odor that um, comes about when someone's blood sugar is either too high or too low and the dogs can be trained to pick up on that. Let's talk then about your facilities itself. How many dogs do you have there at any given time? Well, we typically have about 100 dogs that are in training. Um, depending on the time of the month, we might have 30 dogs that have just come back from their puppy raiser homes and are um, about to start their formal harness training. Um, then we could have anywhere from eight to 50 puppies in our um, puppy and breeding kennel. Um, and then we might have dogs that come in or out um, our breeder dogs that come on campus when their services are needed, that sort of thing. So we could have upwards of 200 dogs on campus at any given time. Yeah, I notice that bark, a lot of barking, <laughs> <laughs> although you're away and that's pretty good because it's a good facility. Let's start with, we have a, a breeding, mm -hmm. all right? You have special dogs that you use to breed uh, both the uh, the males and the bitches, correct? We do. We have um, we have a breeding colony of about seventy dogs right now, um, and they while they're not um, using their services on campus, they live in host homes, um, which is a great thing. Um, so more people in the community helping us out. Um, we breed Labradors, Golden Retrievers, and then a mix of the two that we call a Goldador. Um, and we've been breeding, you know, for thirty one years now. So we've kind of figured out exactly what it is that makes the best guide dog. Um, so we're looking for health, intelligence, and trainability. Um, and we have a fantastic genetics and reproduction staff that um, really work hard to make sure that we get the very best dogs and that our dogs get the very best care. And they're all born on campus. Um, we have special whelping rooms. Um, we also have in our new um, Bar Paul Veterinary Center, we have um, special for high risk um, pregnancies where a c-section might be in, um, oh. it needed then we have mm -hmm. our veterinarian there and a, a beautiful whelping room for the for the dog 
We have a staff that takes care of them 24-7. And the puppies start their training right from birth. They're handled, they're um, turned upside down, their ears are played with, their paws are played with, all to get them used to um, you know, being handled later on. And children coming down and playing with them is exactly. part of that training. Exactly. Up until they're, um, they're handled by staff members and by volunteers for about the first six weeks. And then when they hit six to nine weeks old, they're in our puppy hugging area. So that's when the general public can come in and play with them. Now my neighbors, George and Nancy, who are just two wonderful people, have a guide dog that they socialized, mm -hmm. and, and they got him back because he didn't pass the test again. Well, Gunther's a beautiful dog, I absolutely love him. But if someone wanted to be someone who took a dog in, what would you look for in that person and what would their responsibilities be? Well, we call them puppy raisers because okay. that's what they're doing. They're raising up puppies for us. Um, their responsibility is to take one of our puppies in when they're about nine to 10 weeks old, love it, care for it, teach it basic obedience and expose it to every aspect of life. So that puppy would go with them to work, to school, to the movies, to restaurants, um, on planes, trains, and automobiles, anywhere where a visually... They would have its little jacket so mm -hmm. that they could take it anywhere. So they have access rights, just like full-fledged guide dogs okay. do. Guide dogs in training have access rights in Florida because they need to get the experience. Sure. What makes a really terrific guide dog is confidence. So the more confidence we can instill in that dog when they're puppies, um, the more confident of a dog they're going to be later in life when, they're, when they've got somebody's you know, safety in their hands. What kind of expenses would a puppy raiser have? Puppy raisers take care of the food and the flea and tick preventative um, and whatever toys and leashes, that sort of thing. Um, we handle, Just like you owned your own dog. Mm -hmm. We handle um, the, the veterinary costs and yeah. um, the heartworm. That's a big cost there. It is, it is. And um, we also have uh, partnerships with um, our food providers, so we get coupons for um, you know, money off the food, that sort of thing. So. When George and Nancy were raising Gunther, and then it came time for Gunther to go back for the regular training. I was broken hearted. <laughs> well, the dog's going back. We're not going to see Gunther. And, and I, I tell you, I was really excited when he came home. But, yeah, uh, um, Gunther's a great dog. Um, yeah, you know what the best remedy for um, having to turn in a guide dog is picking up the next puppy and starting the process all over again. So we have a lot of puppy raisers that do that. They're kind of like potato chips. You can't eat just one. You can't raise just one. Yeah, I, always, I, I have a trouble with Gunner, Gunther. It's, I, I get the two mixed up. But uh, Gunner is just an absolutely gorgeous dog. He is I a love beautiful him. dog. And, and now he'll be kind of an ambassador, right, since he didn't work with the training? Yeah, his, he, you know, he just wasn't, that wasn't his career. He wasn't supposed to be a guide dog. Um, and that happens with some of the dogs. Some, you know, some dogs are better than other and and other dogs for those sorts of things, um, to be guide dogs or to be a service dog. Um, sometimes they just don't want to work like that, and that's fine. Um, Gunner is a great representation for us out in the community. Oh, he is. He's a beautiful and animal. George and Nancy, they were our volunteers of the year a couple of years ago. Great neighbors, too. They are fantastic people. Actually, Nancy was on campus this morning when I was on my way here. Oh, really? She was doing a tour for some people. So, yeah, they are fantastic, fantastic um, ambassadors for our well, they, program. Well, they had a party for about 35 <laughs> people at, at Gunner's birthday, his two-year birthday. That's great. That's great. You get very attached to the dogs, but you know, if you're if you're a puppy raiser and you go through the um, all of the hard work of getting that dog ready to be a guide dog, and then you send it off to school for us to for our certified trainers to train them, um, and then you get to see them working with their handler. It's the most amazing experience you could ask for. You um, are so prideful in what you've done to help somebody else. It really is an, an amazing um, gift so, that you've given someone. So what, what is the criteria? There must be some kind of criteria to be a puppy raiser. I, I know we have a number of them in Sun City Center. We have all over Hillsborough County. All over Hillsborough County. We have a number of um, puppy raising groups in the area. Um, to be a puppy raiser, you've got you've to be um, enthusiastic about um, what you want to do for us, um, obviously. Uh, you would go through an application process and then we would do a couple of interviews with you. Um, you would go to a couple of the puppy raising um, group meetings so that you could see what was going on there to make sure that it's something that you wanted to do. Okay. Um, we would also be able to check your dog handling skills at that point. Um, and so if you needed to be you know, brushed up on that, we could certainly help you with that. And um, we would do a home visit to make sure that your home is um, you know, good for a guide dog, that it would not be 
be somewhere that, that could put them in harm. And um, then it's just a matter of waiting for the right puppy to come along. <laughs> And how often do puppies come along? How many sets of puppies do you have a year? We have puppies just about every week of the year, so um, we're always in need of, of new puppy raisers. So we have them. Um, I'm sure that there are a few there right now if people want to get involved. Well, anybody watching this program, <laughs> if you want to get involved, call the number you'll see on the screen, and I'm sure somebody will get back to you, right? Exactly, exactly. I think one of your staffers actually wants to become a puppy raiser for us. <laughs> well, I think that'd be fun. That'd be great. It's a great job. This would be a wonderful environment to bring them in and walk them through it. Exactly, exactly. You saw Ava when she first got here. She kind of looked around. Um, she's still in training, so um, she's not, ha I guess she hadn't been on a TV set beforehand, but now she's passed out and um, <laughs> relaxing right by my side. You can't ask for a better dog, right? I don't have to work right now. I can go do something. Nope. Else. Take a nap. It was funny when we had the first time I had someone from your organization on, it was your past executive director who was blind, mm -hmm. and she brought her dog, and the dog didn't look right or left, came, laid down beside her, and that was it. Yep, in harness. In harness. And after the show, I said, you know, that's not usual for those. It was a golden lab. And I just said, it's not usual. They're really playful dogs. She said, oh, he's working. I said, what do you mean he's working? She said, he's got his harness on, he's working. She took the harness off, and he was all over the studio, just bang. Oh, yeah. She called him back, put the harness on, he went right back, laid down beside her. Well, when they're puppies, we start off with a puppy coat so that they start to learn that when they have the harness on, they're working. So when they have their coat on, they're working. You know, people ask me all the time, well, do guide dogs ever get to have fun? Do they work all the time? I mean, that's really cruel. And they're just like a regular dog when they're at home. They're not expected to guide their person when they're in their own home. That's their home as well as their handlers. And so okay. they get to have just as much fun as any other dog did. Plus, they get the added benefit of getting to go wherever their handler goes. So they've actually got it better than the family dog. In most instances. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. What else do we have? If we went down there, what else would we see? Uh, you would see our beautiful new Margaret and Isaac Barpaul Veterinary Center, which was just opened um, last month. It was thanks to um, very, very generous supporters of ours, and they put forth a challenge to the community to help them raise $1.5 million to have this facility built and outfitted, state-of-the-art medical care that our staff gets to provide there. We're getting ready to break ground. Actually, we've already broken ground. We're getting ready to start construction of a new um, Keith G. Hurst Canine Assessment Center. What was the name again? Keith G. Hurst. Okay. Um, he's a gentleman in Sarasota who has gotten strong behind our um, cause and um, has done the um, put forth challenges again to the community um, to help him raise the money to build this new facility. Um, and that's going to be the place where after the puppy, like Gunner, left George and Nancy's, mm -hmm. um, came back to campus to begin training, that would be their first stop. Oh, okay. So it's kind of a way to get them back used to living um, kennel life again. And it's also a place where our, our trainers can to begin, uh, begin to assess their um, strengths and weaknesses. So they can see, oh, this dog is you know, really great in this instance, or this dog needs a little work on that. Um, so they'll spend about their first three to four weeks there in the um, Hearst Canine Assessment Center, and then they'll move over to our training kennel and start their training in earnest. You know, we, we really have a beautiful street that I live on because it's very close-knit. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows everybody up and down the street, and it, it's a dead-end street, so, you know, the, we, it doesn't go forever. But we got 11, 12 houses, and very close. Mm -hmm. And when Gunner left, there was a pall over the whole area. It really was. We all felt like something had been missing. What about the dog on the other end? Well, you know, we... You know, the dogs leaving, the people that loved them, cared about them, is there any sense um, of loss that the dog shows? Some of the dogs can get a, l a little stressed, but what we do is we make sure that they have a roommate. So it's kind of like going off to college. Um, when, the dogs go, <laughs> when the dogs go to the... Mom and dad stay home, but the dogs go off to... Okay. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we match them up with another dog that's going to be compatible with them or another... Um, they could be in, in a run with any up to five other dogs. Um, and that way they have a buddy to go through the training with. So ah, they are... Okay. Uh, plus our staff lavish attention on these dogs. I mean, these dogs are our, our biggest commodity. Um, it costs $60,000 to breed, whelp, raise, train, 
match, and then provide lifetime follow-up care to one guide dog team. Sixty thousand dollars for dog. Sixty thousand dollars. Yes. Wow. So we take care of them. We want to make sure that they have the most amazing life um, and that their training goes well. And they have um, aromatherapy, they get massages, they get one-on-one -on -one play time. Um, we have... Gee, can I come? <laughs> so, I, I'm telling you. It's a posh life they live. Um, if, you've ever, if you ever go into any of our kennels, you'll um, notice that it doesn't smell like you would expect a kennel to smell. Oh no, I, we, it was just clean, clean. Mm -hmm. no and question. I think when you were there, it was about feeding time or about running time, one of the two, but that's when the dogs all get riled up because they're yeah. about to do something great. Yep. Um, there, a lot of them are labs, so a lot of them are um, ruled by their stomachs, so when it's lunch time, <laughs> or when it's lunch time they're, they're letting us know they're ready. I have a wife that's that way. <laughs> oh, she um, stays very slim and trim, but, but every two hours. <laughs> you gotta, yep, you gotta keep them fed. Um, and then when it's also playtime, they know that it's playtime, they get to go out and run around and well, have I get have excited with that. Yeah, well, <laughs> see, you guys are perfect together then. <laughs> you know, one of the things I think we need to talk a little bit about before the, we run out of time, and there's so many things I'd like to cover with you, but one of the things that we should look at is if I'm a blind person, how do I get matched up? And this $60,000 dog, how do I get it? Okay. Um, well, you would go on to, the best place to do would go onto our website. There's an application there that is obviously um, reader accessible. Um, you can also call our um, department, our graduate services department, and they could speak with you about it. Um, but do a little research, make sure that it's the right school for you, put in an application. Then just like the puppy raisers went through an application process, the um, handlers do as well. So they would go through that. We would do a home visit. Um, we would check on orientation and mobility skills because while this dog will get you from point A to point B safely, um, you need to know how to get from point A to point B by yourself to begin with. You don't want to just tell the dog, well, take me to the library and then expect the dog to take you there when the dog might want to go to the bakery instead. So um, you need to know, have good orientation and mobility, know where you're going and how to get there. And then and the dog really is there with you to prevent obstructions, correct? To there, well, you have to yes. know where you're going. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. You need to know what turns you need to make, how you get to where you're going. Um, the dog can help you find a door or find an exit, um, that sort of thing. But if you're, you know, going to work in the morning, you need to know your route to get to work. Um, the dog will learn it over a certain amount of time, but you don't want to just rely solely on the dog. So then you go through that process, and then we're going to learn as much about you as possible because we want to make sure we match up the right person with the right dog. So if you live in um, an urban environment, um, you do a lot of stuff where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic um, or a lot of regular traffic, we want to make sure that we have the right dog for you. So we're going to match you up based on personality along with how quickly you walk and how much um, pull you like on the harness handle in order to be guided. Those are all things that go into the mix of how we match you up with the dog. Once you're accepted, then you come down to your facility? That's you correct. Actually live on campus? You live on campus for 26 days. We have nine dorm rooms um, and um, it's a fantastic facility. Um, you come in, we're going to do another walk with you to see, to judge your pace and pull again. Um, and then the trainers kind of go and get together and huddle up and see which dog is going to be perfect for which person. And then they bring it up on the second day that you're there and then you spend the rest of the 26 days learning how to work as a team with that dog. And it starts off slowly on campus, um, and then it, we branch out to different areas in um, Sarasota and Manatee County, and then it all culminates in going to downtown Tampa and crossing eight lanes of traffic. Wow. And I don't know about you, but I don't like crossing traffic like that, and I'm fully sighted, but having to rely on a guide dog, it really is a pretty amazing feat. Just building confidence mm -hmm. that the dog can do what you want. Now, what is the cost of this person who comes down there? Absolutely nothing. They a sixty thousand dollar dog, handed over, twenty six days of training, and no cost to the person that's blind. And lifetime follow up care. Wow. So if you get home with your dog and you're having an issue with one of your routes that you can't seem to fix, we'll send a trainer to you to make sure that you can that you can travel safely. 
Now, once the person takes the dog, though, they're totally responsible for that dog, correct? Yes, I that's mean, correct. veterinary care, all that sort of thing. That's correct. Right. We do have vet partners um, mm -hmm. throughout the United States that um, do dis certain discounts depending on how um, helpful they are with us. Um, and then if they're close to campus, then there's always the opportunity to come to the vet center on campus. Oh, they could bring it back we're, to the vet center. We're working up to that. Um, since, we, <laughs> since we just opened up our, the Bar Paul Vet Center, that is, that is the idea, though, is that they can come onto campus for that. Now, how far away can somebody come? This is going to be on the Internet, so how far away can somebody be? We, we service the <laughs> full um, 48 contiguous United States, so as far up north as Maine and as far west as Washington State, we have, um, we have dogs placed there. Well, how's Ava doing down there? She's still sleeping? She is. She's handling it like a champ. Ava. <laughs> Ava, girl. She said, there's nothing for this me here. Old there's hat. no food. There's nothing. I've gotten used to it. And that's yep. what you want with that kind of animal, correct? Exactly. So she would be a great dog for someone who worked in an office. Um, and they needed a dog that would settle down easily as soon as they start their work, um, but then be ready to go when that person is ready to go. How long before Ava will actually be matched up now with somebody? She will be two years old um, on the day after Christmas, so um, usually they're matched when they're about two, so she's at probably at the tail end of her um, training. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's an exciting The thing. whole thing is exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, you really need to go down and visit you can pull up the address on the internet, go to their website, you'll get a directions. But it is an absolutely beautiful facility just to go down and walk around. But call and make an appointment, play with the puppies. <laughs> There's nothing more fun than playing with those puppies. They're just absolutely fabulous. It's Jennifer, fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to come down here and talk with us today. Well, thank you for having us. We really appreciate the support. If mm -hmm. I knew someone was blind, would I just tell them to get on your website and go down there? They could, um, if, you, if, if that's what they're wanting. If they're wanting to get a guide dog, sure, come check us out. That is absolutely beautiful. Of course, I would assume anybody that had a blind person in their family, they'd all be welcome to come down and look at the same time, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We do tours for, for families, for prospective students. Yes, they can come down and, and talk to our graduate services department and see what, what all is in store for them. Great, but they should make an appointment. Absolutely, absolutely. Please make an appointment. <laughs> it's too hard to do otherwise. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. You're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are. We'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. Again, Jennifer Bement, thank you so much for coming. And Ava, time to wake up. It's over. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Thank you.